Um, I'm going to try and keep this talk reasonably short because there's three cases which throw up really interesting issues for those of us who prescribe drugs and for those of us who take prescription drugs. So I'm hoping you'll have loads of questions and that we'll have a long Q&A session. So the first case involves a man in his early 50s who had been uh, a nurse, but is now running his own health service company. He has a wife and three children. Life is going well. He has a minor problem like all of us can have. He has a period of poor sleep. So he goes along to the family doctor and asks for some help to sleep. And he gets given sertraline, Zoloft. Now, this is the pill that I wouldn't ever give anyone to help them sleep, but it's one that's used widely by many family doctors, particularly in the United States. He goes back to the family doctor after a week and says, look, you know, I'm feeling more anxious and my sleep is worse. So the family doctor refers him to the premier psychiatric clinic in the area. This is a well-known clinic with a very good reputation and 54 psychiatrists. The man goes there and they review him and say, well, look, and well, first of all, they give him rating scales to check how anxious he is, how depressed he is. And then they say, look, we'll increase your dose of sertraline from 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams. And you can come back in a week and we'll see how you are. So he comes back in a week and he's worse. The rating scales say he's worse. So they say, let's increase the dose from 100 milligrams to 200 milligrams. And you can come back in a week or two. He comes back in a week or two and he's much, much worse. Whatever the problems were to begin with, now they're much worse than they were. So they say, we're going to switch the sertraline to escitalopram. And they do that. And he's due to come back to see them two weeks later. And on the day he's due to go back to the clinic, he shoots his wife, he shoots his three children, and he kills himself. Now, the rest of the extended family take an action against the clinic. And the clinic says, look, this isn't our fault. If this man had been in hospital with us, we had a duty of care to him, but he's at home. So, you know, our duty of care does not extend into his home. And they say something else with which we can all agree, which is that it's hard to predict when a patient who's got a mental illness is going to become violent. No one can do it. That's fine, except this man had a condition that probably wasn't a mental illness, and whatever it was, he was awfully mild to begin with. And even if he had a severe mood disorder, the drugs he was on are a hundred times more likely to cause the problem that we've just had than a severe mood disorder is. And if he had a mild mood disorder or none at all, then yeah, the drugs are at least a thousandfold more likely. So there's a duty of care here, I think, which is when we give a prescription drug, we're poisoning someone. We poison them, hoping to bring good out of the use of a poison. We can't do it safely if we don't recognize that we're actually poisoning people and they may be poisoned and that we need to keep an eye out for any hints or signs that they're being poisoned. And if they are being poisoned, then we need to take steps to try and make sure that things don't go wrong. And ideally, we need to put a note in the medical record saying, look, we've recognized the problem and here's what we're doing about it. In the case of this man, he had a classic textbook case of SSRI-induced agitation. Our akathisia is a word that's often used, but probably the best word is the word delirium. He goes downhill as the drug dose uh, increases, and it's over just the right time course for thing to be caused by the drugs. The clinic have appealed this, well, took this to an appeal court, and it's now gone to the state Supreme Court, and we're still waiting to hear what they think. But if the clinic lose in the state Supreme Court, the nurse who is prescribing this drug is going to have a problem. I don't know where the 54 psychiatrists were. Maybe they've all gone into management. Maybe they're out on the golf course. Or 
maybe there's no policy which says the nurse, if things are going wrong, should refer to someone else, the doctor. Now, I don't think the policy should be referred to the doctor because the doctor knows more, but you'd expect a clinic to have some kind of policy which recognizes that things may go wrong on treatment, and it may be good to have more than one person looking at what's going on. Let me take you to case number two. This is a lady who has worked as a care assistant in healthcare. She's in her late 50s. 20 or 30 years previously, she'd been given Prozac for a mild case of being anxious, and it didn't suit her. It made her worse. A few years later, she was given amitriptyline, and it didn't suit her. It, it made her worse as well. So they're both serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And then when she gets nervous around the time that I'm going to tell you about now, she goes along to a doctor she knows in a clinic who puts her on citalopram, to which she reacts poorly. Now, she can't afford to go back to, to the clinic because this is not a wealthy lady. This is a lady who ends up having to go along in uh, the state she's in to what's called a health and welfare clinic, where she gets seen by a nurse prescriber who says, well, you're clearly uh, not well. It looks like this drug isn't suiting you. Let's change you over to Prozac. She goes home on Prozac and 48 hours later calls the clinic and says, look, I'm worse than this. This is not suiting me. The nurse checks with her boss, who's also a nurse, and they think, well, look, this lady needs to be told to stay on these drugs for the next two weeks because they take two weeks or more to work. So she gets told, stay on these drugs till you come in to see us again in two weeks' time. She comes in to see them again in two weeks' time with her husband, who says to them, look, she's much worse than she's letting you know, uh, that she's not looking after herself, she's not cleaning herself, she's not doing anything, and she's talking about harming herself. So... They say the nurse seeing her says, well, look, you know, it's still going to take a bit longer for these drugs to work. Stay on them. So a week later, she comes back to the clinic and parks her car in the car park and takes a gun out of the glove compartment of the car and shoots herself in the face. Now, she's trying to shoot herself in the head and kill herself. She removes an eye, but she doesn't kill herself. Her husband and herself later take a legal action. Later, afterwards, actually, when she gets seen afterwards, when she recovers from her head injury, she's put on mirtazapine, which is a completely different kind of drug to the SSRIs and seems to suit her quite well. So it's not the case that there weren't drugs that would actually suit her. But anyway, she and her husband take a legal action against the clinic. The nursing staff who are being deposed under oath say they agree. These, the SSRIs on all antidepressants come with black box warnings. The standard of care is that you should recognize when things are going wrong. They say, well, look, when she talked about being more anxious at work, we just thought it was, as with all work, you know, you can be anxious at work and the problems may be getting worse and that's making you more anxious. And they noted that she had said she had been drinking alcohol during this period and they put a lot down to the alcohol that uh, as she drank, they didn't seem to recognize that one of the best treatments for the agitation SSRIs can cause is alcohol. So as it turns out, the nurses in this case are probably okay, because in the state this happened, there's a law which says you cannot sue an employee of the government. Her lawyers are trying to see what can be done about that. Let me take you to the third case. And this is a lady who's a nurse. She's in her early 40s. And uh, she had first been given SSRIs when she was in her teens. She was given three different SSRIs and responded poorly to all of them. She later dropped out. Um, you know, she took to drugs of abuse. She drank a lot and things like that. And then in her late 20s, reformed her life and became a nurse and had children, as you'll hear. So um, she also had pain. She was left with health issues after a wild period during her 20s. She had sacroiliac joint degeneration. She had lumbar spine problems. And she later was told she had 
fibromyalgia. She was also mildly hypertensive. So she was on a group of drugs for pain and she was on antihypertensives. And at one point for the fibromyalgia, she was given tramadol, which as you may know, is also a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And she responded poorly. She was restless on it. They switched her over to venlafaxine, which is closely related to tramadol. And actually this did better from the point of view of the fibromyalgia. One of the unusual things that happened while she was on it though, was she ended up with a driving under the influence of alcohol offense. It's called a DUI um, in English. And um, what's not well known is that drugs like venlafaxine and SSRIs can cause you to drink where you didn't drink before. And when you drink, even if you just drink a little bit, you can end up with a blood alcohol level that is much higher than it would have been if you weren't on the pill. And that stays higher for longer than uh, it would have stayed up if you weren't on the pill. So uh, the venlafaxine works well for a period, but then stops working. And she and her nurse prescriber talked through the issues and they decide, let's try Cymbalta, which is closely related to and the vaccine are, you know, broadly speaking, works in much the same kind of way. And it's also maybe good for pain. Um, so they give her that and she responds in a mixed kind of way, not all that good, but then she halts it because she gets pregnant and she stays off all pills for more or less a year and actually feels quite good. After the pregnancy, she has a postpartum mood disorder and she talks to her nurse prescriber again, and they agree again, let's try Cymbalta again. Now, let me tell you about Cymbalta. This was the drug that Lily were going to bring on the market after Prozac, after the patent on Prozac ran out. I was one of the people that was going to run a clinical trial on this drug, but then they stopped uh, the trial and seemed to indicate that they weren't going to develop this drug at all. They didn't say why, but the guess has to be that maybe they thought it could cause problems. Boringer Ingelheim picked up this drug and brought it on the market in Europe as a, as a bladder stabilizing drug. Lily instead thought they'd bring the R isomer of fluoxetine, R fluoxetine on the market <clears throat> to succeed Prozac. But when they brought the data to FDA, FDA said, look, this causes QT interval problems, heart problems, uh, which of course, if it causes heart problems, Prozac does too, and that wasn't in the label. And FDA said they wouldn't be able to approve the drug. So Lily instead went back and fished duloxetine out of the filing cabinet and developed it quickly and brought it to FDA saying, here's the data. Can you approve this for treating people who are depressed and for bladder stabilization purposes? FDA said, we cannot approve it for bladder stabilization purposes. In the trials you've shown us, too many healthy, normal women have gone on to suicide attempts or completed suicide. And in the healthy volunteer trials that Lily ran in this drug, which they had to run, a healthy volunteer called Tracy Johnson, a 19-year-old woman, committed suicide. But FDA approved the drug for treating people who are depressed. Lily then had a marketing package which said, and it's good for pain as well. So this is why this lady was being put back on it. She goes on it and the first response is reasonably good. She says, you know, this seems to help uh, you know, the pain I have. And after a few weeks, about 10 weeks or so, she's more restless and agitated and uh, ends up saying to the nurse who's prescribed it for her that it's making me manic, let's stop it. So they halt it. And over the next year, a few other pills get tried. Uh, at this stage, you have to realize that she's on quite a mix of pills between one thing and the other. And some of these may be blocking the adverse effects of Cymbalta when she goes on it. But anyway, she goes back to the nurse prescriber and they decide they've tried a few other things. Let's go back to the Cymbalta because perhaps she only had a poor response the last time because of her mood disorder, which she doesn't now have. So they put her back in Cymbalta and for the first few weeks, things seem to be reasonably okay. And then she begins to get more agitated 
and restless. And around the same time period that she had problems and asked to be taken off some Balta the previous time, at work she's doing poorly, people notice things. At home she's doing poorly, people notice things. She's very agitated and she heads off one day to the mountains to pick mushrooms or whatever. And on the way home, veers across the road head on into an oncoming car. She isn't injured all that badly, but the other person driving the car, uh, who's driving legally, is injured. When the police come along, they see that she's on the wrong side of the road. They check her alcohol level, and it's way, way up. Now, because of the previous driving under an influence charge, this lady, uh, and because she's a nurse, part of the conditions that I've been able to work is she gets checked every two weeks or so for drugs of abuse and alcohol. And over a two-year period, she is absolutely clean. There's no evidence of anything. So it's a little inexplicable why she's had drink on her. Uh, this may be uh, an effect of the symbolta she's been put on, which is a thing that not many people know about. It's inexplicable. She can't tell anyone where she's been drinking. She can't recall it. She doesn't recall drinking, but her blood alcohol level is very, very high. And what no one knows is how many drinks it took to get it that high. It may be just one beer that has put her way over the limit. But what's actually going on? Well, what's going on is unclear. She's got a very hazy memory of what happened. One of the options, which is incompatible with her view of herself, is that she's tried to commit suicide. Okay, when this case gets framed like that, for the state in which she's in. And when it gets said, look, she's not akathisic or whatever, she's become delirious on this drug. The state freaks. They say, look, FDA and EMA in Europe would never uh, approve a drug that could make you delirious. Uh, if you're delirious, this is an absolute defense against murder or any serious crime so that the person should be able to walk free from the court if they're delirious. And that's not something that the legal system can handle all that easily. Okay, so I think there are profound issues here for any of us who prescribe drugs or who take prescription drugs. This is not something that just applies to antidepressants. It applies to all drugs. Trying to get doctors to take this seriously is very difficult. The only thing that wakes them up that I've found is to say to them, well, if these drugs work wonderfully well and are free of problems, you know, the people who run health services these days are going to see you guys as very expensive prescribers, and they're going to replace you with nurses and pharmacists. The same thing, of course, applies to nurses also, because if the drugs work wonderfully well and are free of problems, well, we're all going to be replaced by robots pretty soon. But the drugs don't work wonderfully well and aren't free of problems. What the legal system uh, that's awfully worried about drugs causing you to become delirious doesn't recognize, and what very few people recognize is the entire literature on unpatent medicines is ghostwritten. There is no access to the raw data from the clinical trials on these drugs. FDA don't see it. EMA don't see the raw data. The authors of articles in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, don't see the raw data. Just to make the point clear for you, recently we've had vaccines brought on the market and all of the clinical trials are reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. And all of them say at the end that they're ghost written and the author of the Pfizer trials has made it clear he has not seen the data on the trial that brought this vaccine on the market. The other thing you need to know is that FDA and EMA approve drugs where there are only negative trials, where there's no positive trial at all. In the case of paroxetine being brought on the market for children who are depressed, GlaxoSmithKline wrote to FDA and said, look, we've got three negative trials in children who are depressed. And FDA said, we recognize these trials are all negative. 
but we're still going to approve the drug. And we agree with you that it wouldn't be a good idea to let anyone know about this. We shouldn't mention it in the label of the drug. Now, you guys say, well, Prozac has been brought on the market for kids with press, so we can use that. But in fact, the trials of Prozac were negative also, and FDA and EMA approved it. So this happens regularly. When, what also happens regularly in the case of paroxetine, the main trial in kids who are depressed was previously published, which said the drug works wonderfully well and is free of problems. This was not unique to this trial. This happens routinely in the case of antidepressants in adult trials as well. And it happens in other trials across medicine that negative trials get published in the literature as being positive. And the regulators who know that, you know, we're being misled, don't say or do anything. I'm almost finished. Let me quickly mention that um, what also happens is in the case of trials that are positive, positive means there's a change on a rating scale. In the same trials, there may be more people who have died on active treatment than died on placebo. So in a sense, we're all being misled and you can't see the raw data to know that more people have actually died. Working for the pharmaceutical companies does not mean that this drug saves lives or gets us back to work. It just means there's a change in some surrogate marker. So the implications for all of us are, these are the trials that are built into the guidelines that we use, into the standards of care. And these things increasingly trump your judgment about what's happening in the patient that you see in front of you, and also trump the judgment of the patient who may be convinced this drug is causing me problems. We're increasingly in a world where you and I risk losing our job if we say, no, in the case of this person, what's happening to them is not what the guidelines say could be happening to them. And if we're going to lose our job for that kind of reason, then the issue for all of us is, is it going to be possible even to recognize that these things are happening to the patient? In the bigger picture, the result of all these drugs which work wonderfully well and are harmless is that we're on more and more drugs. People like me, my age, on average are on five different drugs and lots of people are on more. We know that if you're on more than three drugs, your life expectancy falls and is falling in the Western world. We know that you're more likely to end up in hospital. We know that your quality of life is going to be worse. We also know that our reproductive replacement rates have fallen below the rate needed to keep the same number of people in Holland or Belgium or wherever. How are we going to sort this? Well, I've written to the chair of Supreme Courts, ministers of health, the people who write the guidelines, medical associations, journal editors. Nobody says anything that I'm saying to you is wrong. They say, what can we do about it? Well, I don't know what we can do about it. One of the things might be to get in touch with people who think white people are being replaced and say to them, well, you know, yes, we are being replaced. Uh, by the pharmaceutical companies, and why don't they ask the pharmaceutical companies about their replacement of white people? Um, or maybe say everybody needs universal health care, even in the United States, so that people who aren't white can end up on the same number of drugs that white people are on, because it's mainly white people who are taking all these drugs. The real answer, I think, ultimately has to be political, and we need to build communities. It's communities, in a sense, that are going to keep people off being on too many drugs and recognize that there has to be options other than just multiplying up the number of drugs we take. Thank you. Okay, I think the law is actually the same. Um, in Holland and the rest of Europe and uh, the United States. 
I think Dutch culture, you're right. There is a thing where you guys are a little slower to hand out some of the psychotropic drugs and maybe other drugs too. And that's the thing that I'm interested in. I mean, this is more uh, kind of question for me to ask you. What is it about Dutch culture that means you're possibly prescribing a little less than the French or the Belgians? The Belgians take vast amount of drugs just as much as they take over in the United States. Well, I think, I think there is a culture which has changed. I don't know what's happening in Holland, but the culture when I went into medicine was we're giving poisons, we're hoping to bring good out of the use of a poison, and we need to remember that. The culture pushed in most of the world now is that these medicines are sacraments. S sacraments are something that can only do good. They can't harm you, okay? Uh, and one of the strange things, I don't know what the situation in Holland is, but if you go to France, like I've got one or two cases uh, that actually come from France, and you cannot get a medical person or an expert in France to take the side of the family who has lost a child or someone else through an injury from a drug. You simply can't get medical people to um, get involved on the side of the person who has been injured. Part of the problem is the literature, as I say, is ghost written. Uh, medical people will think that, it, well, for me to try and make the case for a person who's injured, I've got to look at the academic literature and I've got to see evidence there of the harms. Well, there is no evidence there of the harms, okay? Uh, you know, it's not a scientific literature. What I often say in this area uh, to people is that the greatest concentration of fake literature on earth centers on the drugs your doctor gives you. I should change that to centers on the drugs your doctor or your nurse gives you. Uh, the WHO has almost no influence. And if you just talk about antidepressants and say they can cause problems and things like that, what you do is you increase the sales of antidepressants. WHO is going to have to come out and say, the problem is not just drugs can cause problems, because that's we have known that for 50 years. They've got to say what's changed is there's no access to the clinical trial data. The literature is ghostwritten. The regulators are proving drugs on the basis of negative trials. WHO will not say that because, of course, if it applies to the drugs that we're using, it applies to the vaccines as well. And you have to ask yourself, are WHO going to tackle that? And the answer is no. Can I just actually add to that? The first case that I told you about, the man who was switched from sertraline to escitalopram, he was having problems from the sertraline. He was almost certainly going to have problems from the escitalopram as well. But at the end of the day, he will have had lingering problems from the sertraline he had been on. He may have had more problems from the sertraline he was abruptly withdrawn from, and he had a third set of problems probably, which was the s citalopram he was now being put on. So, you know, even if you've been okay on these pills, if you're abruptly uh, withdrawn from them, you may commit suicide because of the delirium and agitation they, they can cause on withdrawal. <laughs> 